Um, welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to hear about the book We Ate, Slept and Drank Feminism 2020, which was edited by Tonya Jeevjong and Inga As. as. Um, and it's going to be discussed by Tonya and a couple of other contributors. Uh, we Ate, Slept and uh, Drank Feminism is a non-fiction book of 350 pages. Uh, and the book has the same format as a record record cover. Uh, and the book was published, published at Svingsa Lesbian Print in uh, 2020. The sign layout and repro is done by Henriette Stensdal. Uh, the cover is a section from an original print made by Leo Sancho. Uh, and I am the editor of the book. Uh, many women, especially lesbians, who was part of the women movement in the 70s, have contributed uh, with uh, photos, facts, posters, and other material. So to be true to the history, we have interviewed and had conversation with many women, but the text in the book is written by Inga Ås from her perspective. That was the wrong way. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for, for this project. Uh, and the, the heading of my preface uh, translated is something like um, uh, women's community, a danger of, of global proportions. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the dra uh, backdrop. Uh, and I, I have been part of the gay and lesbian subculture since I was young. And I experienced uh, all the exciting things it had to offer. Uh, and as a young lesbian, I had access to discotheques for gays and also nightclubs for lesbians, uh, where I could flirt, dance, drink, make friends, fall in love and relax and have fun in places dedicated to women and disturbed by men. And in contrast to this uh, subculture, where a lot was happening, also on the lesbian scene, the main uh, organization for LGB have over time developed uh, a woman oppressing agenda through an uh, organizational culture founded on aggressive, merciless social control. So when the LGB org organization highlighted uh, increased access to children youth and women's bodies on the agenda, I thought, hell no. So in 2015, I created an organization for lesbian and it uh, quickly became a national news story, uh, as it often does when women want to organize without men. And then I thought that there must be must have been lesbian before me who have found, found it vital and necessary for lesbians to have their own organizations. So the same year in 2015, I developed the project, which after meeting with Inga Ås in 2017 and several fabulous lesbians eventually became this non-fictional book. Uh, but it was uh, when I got to know Marianne Rovas uh, Olsen and her photo collection, I truly understood uh, and recognized the impact that the women's movement had on women because I saw it in her photos and uh, yeah they were there uh, and Marianne's uh, pictures are unique because she was part of the movement so she was like an insider uh, and she uh, photographed she was uh, active at demonstrations camps at Svingsa lesbian and she also developed lasting friendships with some of the women she met in this movement. And the most important thing about this book uh, to me is that it documents and transfers to the next generation in pictures what the separate women organization can unleash and how women can learn from each other if they just get the opportunity. Uh, and I think the book is relevant today because it reveals what women can build together when they have places dedicated to women where they can learn, work and focus on women issues and dis undisturbed by men. Yeah. Uh, 
so uh, the main thing about the women's movement that I will focus on today is like the women's cells and all the things that grew from there. Uh, so um, I just have to. So um, the inspiration. Let's go and see. Just a minute. Sorry. Yeah. So about the women house, uh, it was like I said, the place where the women could learn from it each other and. No, I'm I'm too. I have to go. Yeah. Uh, together, uh, they uh, the women in the women house de developed ideas, alternatives, and options which they could use actively in the fight for a better life for themselves and all other women. And they wanted to change their own views on themselves by strengthening themselves both theoretically and practically and here you see a, a drawing uh, this drawing is uh, drawn by Elisa Christie and it shows all the different or at least some of the different groups uh, at the at the women's house and um, the, Tony, uh, yeah Tony, I'm just going to say that Anne is Anne is on on the as a panelist now, so we could show her. Uh, we can show her video if you want. If you want to bring Anne in, yeah, or, uh, I would we, love to at any yeah. moments. Yeah, and you've yeah. got her on the phone as well. So just so so you know, she's arrived. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. Um. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these uh, groups that were formed. Uh, and uh, was at the women's house. And uh, here you see um, uh, Svingsa, uh, the print, uh, sorry, the print, print, lesbian print. And it's a photo from a workshop uh, where the women were learning by doing. And it, uh, it was uh, also because uh, the press, or the media would often not uh, they would often not publish articles written by feminists so they thought that then we have to make our own magazines and uh, so that we can get the message uh, out and uh, here you see a picture of the lavendel uh, express which I this women house was really essential uh, for for um, uh, women to meet and develop and exchange thoughts and experiences uh, and the inspiration for establishing a women's house in Oslo came from Copenhagen where uh, in Denmark where a women's house was established in 1971 and it was women associated uh, uh, with the new feminist and the lesbian movement uh, in Norway who took the initiative to the women's house in, in Oslo. And uh, as uh, Elaine Miller, the brilliant uh, psych uh, physiotherapist uh, and uh, activist say, when women come to bed together, we build shit. And uh, Uh, there was uh, Norwegian uh, lesbians and other women going to the tribunal in uh, in uh, Brussels um, in 1976, and uh, when they when they came back from uh, from this uh, uh, tribunal. Um, where they had learned about uh, crimes against women and violence against uh, women. Uh, they uh, on a month they uh, uh, found that they 
needed like to, needed um, to do something to help uh, help women and uh, so they wanted the crisis hotline and the crisis shelter for women uh, And uh, the crisis center group was formed after a meeting uh, at the women's house uh, that addressed this tribunal in Brussels concerning violence against women. And the crisis center group had a close collaboration with the uh, JURK, which is like the legal advice for women, uh, which gave uh, free uh, legal advice uh, for women. Uh, and the women uh, and the women house in and they also was in. Uh, connection with the women house when it came to international women's day and slogan and paintings and the uh, uh, gar brandmare which you know who is the author uh, of uh, egalia's daughters uh, recounts that uh, she appealed to the city council in oslo for fund to establish a crisis center hotline in oslo <clears throat> and was denied because she couldn't document uh, the need. And then she wrote back that it would be difficult to document the need before they had a phone. And they were granted support after all uh, and could document the need. Eventually, uh, they also received support for the first crisis center in Norway. And uh, a woman a feminist called Janne Krogstad uh, said that it was pure coincidence, co coincidence that I got involved. Because every Monday the Women's House organized theme meetings and it was in the Monday meeting group and, and she was in the Monday meeting group and was responsible and violence against women was hardly an issue for, for her but uh, before this meeting. But she was leading the meeting and um, uh, that was that. Uh, at the meeting there was uh, almost uh, only unknown ladies, women. And they had no idea how big it would become. Uh, and the whole tone was plastered with small notes with the um, Pamilla crisis hotline for raped and abused women and the phone number and the phone number to the crisis uh, hotline. And the uh, lavendel, it was like a lavender writing on white background. Uh, and the notes uh, were strategically placed on the lead of every toilet roll. So the crisis group was formed, uh, as I said, after uh, this Monday meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and that was that. Uh, and also this uh, Jürk, which is like uh, giving uh, free advice to, to women they are still existing. Uh, and one of the reasons I knew uh, about um, how damaging uh, porn and prostitution is for women was uh, because of a woman named Unirusta. And when I was young, she traveled around uh, in Norway and showed pictures that uh, revealed how de dehumanizing porn magazines and porn films actually were. Uh, and uh, I watched Unirista's uh, at TV debates and all the angry men and women attacking her for her views and uh, knowledge. And I was hit by her bravery and attitude. Uh, and women, I think we all know this, that women who fight for the close down of porn and pimping and prostitution industry are attacked with an insane anger. Uh, but she had this punky grace and uh, just stood there tall, uh, looking cool, responding with facts. So, and uh, then I found that the women in the generation before me, they had like uh, the same attitude towards this as I had. And we can see it in these pictures where they have demonstrations against porn and prostitutions, prostitution. And another group that was uh, came out of the women's house was uh, Women in Combat, 
combat called Kick. Uh, and they trained women in self-defense, like Taekwondo and Jiu Jitsu. Uh, and uh, the training and courses took place in other premises, but uh, Kick uh, had demonstrations and introductions at the women's house. And many of the women were also members of several groups and women organizations. And uh, one of the, I mean, the the woman you see on the right uh, side here is called the Bente Ottersen. Uh, and uh, she was like the, um, um, yeah, I don't know what you should call it, but she was like, uh, like you see, really, she was, she, yeah. Uh, uh, but at, in the book, she and, uh, and uh, Helen Fucht, who is another woman, r writes that um, women in combat uh, was conceived and born at the women's house. Uh, initially, uh, we were a small group of young women who trained in Taekwondo, Judo, Ido, Judo and Jiu Jitsu and Aikido. Uh, through kick, we contributed with what we had learned to make uh, many women stronger so that violence and threats of violence would not be able to would not uh, would make them able to yeah, oh my god uh, so that violence uh, threats would not be able to prevent them from moving freely in air areas we developed self-defense courses that thousands uh, have par participated in and mostly adult women and young girls but uh, also developed special courses for senior women and for little girls and there we are at the uh, women at the sorry Folk High School in Denmark, and if uh, Kanata can hear me, it would be lovely if you could talk about uh, what you did there. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the um, I, I, as an introduction, I have to say that the Scandinavia has the uh, over 100 year old tradition for what we call folk high schools. And they are established to uh, for uh, for ordinary people to be able to have uh, courses on uh, a maximum of nine months uh, on certain thematic things and and it is all also for adults. Uh, and uh, when it was started, it was started to, especially for uh, farmers or peasants. And the courses was had two two sides. One was to learn basic subjects like reading, writing, uh, mathematics, and so on. And the, the other thing was practical uh, subjects like uh, uh, yeah, machinery, farming. And it was one of the schools, it actually it was the school in Denmark that first let women students in uh, in, the eight, in the 19th century. This uh, long tradition developed also in Norway and Sweden. And it is out of this, the uh, idea of, uh, it made it possible to, uh, to uh, come with an idea about a women's high school, women's folk high school. And uh, the idea sprang out of uh, a women's camp on Femu, which is an island in Denmark that yearly, from 1974, I think, had uh, women's camps. Uh, it's, as a wordplay, it's quite funny because Femu, if you try, it's Fem Island. And, um, and uh, the first group there discussed the possibility of, of uh, creating a a, a, a women's high school, women's folk high school. And from that, already within a year, the first group had settled and the uh, first seminar had been held. And it was decided uh, both uh, what aims the school should have and, uh, and what uh, uh, sort of principles of work or, or ways of work one should have uh, uh, at the school. Um, it developed in both Sweden, Denmark, and uh, 
Norway, but mainly in Denmark, because Denmark had different economical politics to as who could join a folk high school. And uh, the biggest group was in Copenhagen, and then it was like satellites in Sweden and in Norway. Uh, I was uh, I joined this uh, satellite in Norway, and uh, uh, during a few meetings uh, to try to collect money and figuring out who to, where to apply and how to manage to find this school, all the practical matters. The school opened in 1979, and, and before that, it has been had been established what was called an outmoving group which uh, consisted of uh, uh, around 10 women, I can't remember the exact number, from uh, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, where there was me from Norway and one woman from Sweden, Finland, and uh, the rest were Danish. And uh, we were in charge of um, uh, looking at other folk high schools with, with, uh, uh, with particular semantics, like, for example, the socialistic folk high school, where we visited to see how does it function, how do they manage the economics, how do they organize, and so on, and to find a place. And we found um, an inn uh, that uh, was not, you know, that was um, closed, a closed inn by a tiny little railway station in southern Denmark, uh, managed to raise the money for the payout and bought the inn. And uh, the first, and moved out there, and the first, sort of courses was based on particularly lesbian feminists who came and helped with rebuilding the inn and uh, making the, 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 the soil, because there was quite a lot of land to go with it, uh, uh, preparing it for um, growing vegetables. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, you could say the idea was that uh, this was going to be a school only for women to function in uh, in uh, in the spirit or whatever you can call it in the idea of the, the women's movement theories and uh, and um, ways of working together, and it was to be a cultural factor to uh, uh, spread the ideas of the women's movement. It was to be have a uh, as a basis, uh, women political, um, uh, yeah, it was gonna, going to, to be based on, on women, uh, women's political ideas uh, with the uh, aim of uh, increasing consciousness for women about their situation and to activate women and to motivate women to break out of the traditional uh, gender or sex role, uh, both uh, both about work, about uh, family, and politically. And the idea was to build the uh, ways of working uh, to further develop a feministic pedagogy, pedagogic ways of learning. There's a word I can't uh, uh, pronounce. Pedag ped ped uh... Pe yeah, pedagogical. Or, or you could say educational, educational, or, or yeah. pedagogical. Yeah, aiming to to abolish the uh, the lines between uh, the, the difference between teachers and uh, students by uh, creating uh, a mutual, a mutual methods uh, or anti authoritarian methods, and to uh, remove the uh, moments of uh, competition and to uh, tie together theoretical and practical ways of, of working and uh, give uh, knowledge that is important for women in their daily life and in their uh, fight for liberation and to develop uh, collective ways of working and ways of living. And uh, uh, therefore it was uh, important to have a school of one own and there were certain things that was going to function and that was it was going to be a library. It was going to be a place where one could sort of make uh, rings in the water politically and culturally. And uh, it was incredibly exciting to be a part of it. We were all relatively young 
and uh, one tried to in the sort of moving out group choose women. It was women who sort of wanted to to be in this group and who, uh, if there was particularly knowledge, one could use that because there was land to this place. And I uh, had an agricultural education with a, a special focus on ecological and biodynamical ways of treating the land uh, and the products. So I was part of, uh, uh, my focus was very much on that part. Uh, um, but uh, everybody did everything. Uh, I mean, we 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 were building, we were uh, uh, bricklaying, we were um, driving and repairing tractor, we were preparing the land, we were building uh, three by six meters compost bunches uh, uh, out of biodynamical principles, and we had ever such a lot of fun doing all this. Um, after the first course, you can say that they that that was quite a long course. That was five months, and that was based on very much on sort of see how can we make this work? How how can we build this so we can use it? How can we rebuild it and repair it so we can use it? And how can we grow our land? And how can we store our vegetables? We also uh, came into. Um, the eco-feminist way of thinking, where both the ways of, uh, you know, one wasn't allowed to smoke uh, only in one room and or out on the property. Uh, the, uh, the 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 food was uh, vegetarian and it was ecological, um, and uh, the way the decisions was made was made in community. The, the basis was the I don't know if it's called basis groups in England in England. Uh, it sprung out of the feministic uh, political uh, way, the, the way that uh, a group of women, like let's say between five and ten women, uh, belonged in one group. And this group met uh, in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day uh, to talk about both uh, what had been going on during the day, what had been done, what sort of difficulties had one met, how had one solved it. Uh, um, it was uh, praise and criticism, and also if someone had any personal issues, both by being there or other personal issues. And this strengthened the way we we functioned together very much because no one, sorry, you can say no one was left out. Everybody had a possibility in a small group to to present themselves and what they felt around what they were doing and how they were feeling. Uh, as a, a continuation of this, one started to let out courses in on the length of one week, two weeks, four weeks, five weeks, and it was all sorts of different courses. And but the one of the things in the sort of on the on the fun, fundament of this was that they were always running courses in agriculture, uh, ecological agriculture, and in building. Um, I was there the first year, and the, the idea about uh, uh, feministic education was that no one was going to stay there so long or have a position so long that their ideas came to dominate. So the, the first idea was that you could only be a sort of a, a fixed teacher there for a year at a time. And uh, of course, we couldn't afford to pay all the teachers because we needed more people to teach than we had money. And that functioned. In the 70s, most things functioned because we were so idealistic. And um, so I was there the first year. And, the, and the, there was summer courses and there were longer courses all the way through the years where the, the, this women's, high, women's folk high school functioned. Um, it also brought things out from the the, the, the high school where they uh, where we had sh shorter like seminars or courses all around the country. There were mainly Danish students because in Denmark you could they had a different economical priority. You didn't have you could get quite a lot of support if you, for example, just had finished your high your ordinary high school and didn't quite know what to do, or if you were unemployed, or if you were many different things. So. 
you, they could afford to come. It was different for Sweden and Norway. They had to pay full price, got no support from the state to go to this school. So there were le much less uh, students from other Nordic countries. But there were teachers from other Nordic countries who came and talked in subjects like theater or music or history. or uh, And that was sort of the focus on the courses by and by was a lot, lot of different things there were there, they had um, like uh, if we take the first year they had uh, they were, we had courses about women in society uh, courses about women over 40 uh, about um, women's history uh, about uh, music theater uh, women's culture women's literature uh, and later we had women in research uh, and uh, by and by, we started to ask, ask the society more, which sort of or women more generally got uh, interested in different things. They also came up more sort of spiritual uh, subjects like uh, uh, witch feasts or, or uh, astrology or uh, uh, the mystery of the tarot cards and so on. But all was tried to be kept, always kept in a sort of in a feministic ideology. Uh, there were also courses in uh, how to fix your car or how to defend yourself. Uh, there were courses about uh, 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 violence against women, and I can't mention them all. There were incredibly many, uh, and the the ones who were teachers were sort of changed out all the time. And also the subjects was uh, by and by was made by who could teach what can you teach, uh, and um, the school as such lived for 16 years, from 1978, I think we can say, to 1994. And one can see that the first years, out to the mid-80s, we managed to fill, the, the school managed to fill the number of students that was necessary to keep it running, because the, the school was non-profitable. And uh, that meant that you, you couldn't, you never had a sort of a surplus in the economy that was anything to count about. So it run, it could only run for as long as there was enough students to come there, enough women who were interested in being there. And to try and survive, they, they used all kinds of methods. They also had good courses for immigrant women and for uh, women, refugee women. Uh, language courses, courses about how to 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 fit into the Danish society as a woman from a different culture and so forth. But uh, from the mid eighties up to ninety three, gradually the number of students interested in coming declined, and in ninety four the school uh, had to shut down. Okay. Uh, it, the the very the very thing you can say this is more a description of the school but the thing that was fantastic about the women's high school was the way it became a sort of a center at least in Denmark it was very much a center for uh, culture and for politics and it was incredibly fun it was the way women worked together the way where one hand let go another hand took over the way everybody went to do everything and. The, the spirit was like, okay, I'm sure I can do it because I've never done it before. And um, and uh, it, it, it was, I, I think it is, it sort of is a lighthouse in 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 that era because um, it, it's, it, it's incredibly many women who's been there. Also women who has, had no earlier connection to the feminist movement or the lesbian movement. And uh, for all the time, all the years it was there, there was there was women who was not lesbian. There was uh, during sixteen years there were many women, but the sort of the the motor, the engine, was always lesbian feminists for those years. Oh, Any, uh, th thank I, you. I think I've, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Kan uh, mm. So then we move on to next picture which is like um, the women's cultural festival and Anne do are you do you want to say something about that yes that was a typical example of they said we can do it and we did it we're women in Oslo and they came actually from all over the country but women 
took over the capital for one week and we had arrangements everywhere in cultural institutions, in the streets. The women's house was open every day for every woman. And we ended it with a festival, a great festival that also nobody ever thought we could bring on, but which actually also brought a lot of money so we could go on. Having a radio of Rachel that was a women's radio that was created and we created places where women could rehearse. It was a problem for female bands and female musicians that it wasn't accepted to be a female band. So the guys had all the rooms to rehearse, women and any of their own, except the private small one. It also showed a lot of art, what what women actually could do, theatres, uh, musicians all over the town, and we had courses like history, women's history, told in a different way, the way the men never told the history, that also included the witches and all the problems women had had to come forth with the knowledge. Um it lasted for a week, and I think it's the only time at that time in my life where I experienced that the news in Norway actually called us up and asked if they could have an interview to hear a little bit more about what was going on in the city. And people with women were bicycling around, dressed up at witches, having witches uh, happenings. Uh, at unknown places that popped up. Um, I, Of course, I don't recall everything, but what I remember is that something was happening every day for one week, and the whole city was sort of women's a women's place. And the freedom of feeling that now, finally, this is our capital was so great, I still remember it. And I think for many of us, it brought it brought this profound feeling that, yes, we can do it. They may say whatever they will, but we can do it. I see you have uh, some, there is a picture of some of the programs. That was uh, an idea of what we would do. It came more to, even more. Um and they were made, I don't know if you have the poster from the, this dragoon, it was made posters all, that was uh, the dragon, posters all over the town were put up, legally or illegally, they were, <laughs> they were painting the town with women and dragoons, dragons. And it was the time, the festival, it was women, it was a discussion among us if we should allow um, so-called established women within the patriarchy because there were some groups who had who had contracts with the record companies where which were already established and i as far as i recall and the reality was that everyone was was well every everybody was welcome no matter who you were if you were a female band, if you were a woman who wanted to sing, if you wanted to sit at the corner in the street singing, whatever you wanted to do if you were a woman, come to the capital of Norway, be there one week, we will do it. And I just loved it. I was young. I loved it. It gave me so much courage to go on. And I think it did for everybody, because when I see now, when I see pictures from this time, we are all smiling. It was not a demonstration. It wasn't sort of a fight. It differed from the Women's Day and all the demonstrations we had where we were for and against politically. It's different because it was a week showing what we could do, a cultural week. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I go out to the next uh, picture and uh, this was um, this is from from Femer um, 
uh, which is like a woman camp in in uh, Denmark. And these are the some of the posters that they made, and lots of Norwegians uh, went to Feme, Feme, uh, and um, like uh, Kanata told me yesterday, that um, um, uh, one week summer camp at Feme wasn't enough for the lesbians, so they got together and made their own lesbian week. And I, I just want to show some pictures of different uh, like uh, camps and different uh, festivals where women meet because it's, I think it's really important for young lesbians to, to know that the feminist movement uh, are not just uh, like intellectual. Uh, it is also flirting, fun, uh, uh, dancing, all those things uh, so that it's all the things you love to do when you are like young. Uh, so here we go. This is um, Women's Culture Festival in, in another place in Denmark, Fallet Parken, Copenhagen, Copenhagen, arranged by something called the <laughs> Rødstrømpene. I can't, uh, I can't uh, translate Red that. Red stockings. Red stockings, yeah. Red Okay. Yeah, and the first one was in 1974, and it was described by uh, women like uh, Nordic Woodstock. Uh, and then we have uh, this picture, which I find so iconic because when I was a, uh, I was like a tomboy when I was uh, young, and people thought I was a boy, and I was told to put on a T-shirt when uh, I got like breasts. And here you see the three, the three women um, without t-shirt in front of the men <laughs> standing behind. And it's like, of course, women can go without t-shirt as long as they are surrounded by other women. So it was like, and I think this, uh, the freedom and the protection women feel uh, when they are like in uh, women places dedicated to women is just like, yeah, something special. And also here is some uh, pictures. Uh, I just have to hang on here. I just have to say it's the wrong uh, version of the uh, PowerPoint and it's the wrong script. So I do have to <laughs> apologize, but uh, let's go on. So no summer without the summer camp. Uh, no, a summer without the summer camp is no sum summer is a quote from the book and a saying. And uh, the lesbians, they had camps uh, and they were flirting, dancing, having fun, bathing and everything. This photo is from uh, a lesbian called uh, Anna Karin Gudminsen. And you see um, uh, also, I think it's a bit uh, uh, funny with all those uh, women in the boat, because as long as it is just women there, it goes okay, it goes good. Uh, but I think women have this, um, uh, lots of women have this urge to, if if a guy is standing there and can I get on board and they say yes and then the whole both sinks. I think that's like quite sim symbolic of what is happening to the women's movement. Uh, and uh, for me, it's like uh, watching these photographs and seeing like these young lesbians and uh, this is Bente Ottersen again, the one the queen, women in combat, and her sign says a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle uh, on her back. Uh, they become like um, uh, uh, forbilder. Hva er det, Kanata? Forbilder, Kanata. Ja, ja, ja. I, I can't hear you, but um, for me, it's like um, it's really empowering to look at these uh, pictures. And here we are in the crowd where the you can see Kanata behind there. And this is a picture of Barbara Adler, which I think is also fantastic because uh, it shows how fun it is to be uh, together with women and have uh, places and organize uh, with the like arrangements with just uh, women. 
And uh, here you have, which is like important to remember today that it's just a small group of women. It wasn't like a big crowd. It started out as a small group of women uh, and they had the guts uh, to fight for their rights and say uh, what they wanted to happen. And uh, this is like a picture of uh, Marianne, a photo of Marianne Roas Olsen, which um, be uh, just before she died, I applied for a big uh, exhibition in Norway with this picture on the left, which says on the sign, support the lesbian in China and Albania, uh, which was like, it was like um, a comment to the communists uh, in, in, Nor in Norway. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, picture also says a lot about uh, friendships and uh, the love and uh, all those things that uh, were like a big part of this um, time and movement. And uh, this sign says lesbian is uh, an important, uh, uh, an important and real and real part of the women's movement, uh, which I think is also important to mention because they were lesbians in all groups and they, uh, they had this energy to do things. Um, and uh, yeah, on the right side here, it's the sign I'm who says I'm not a bag. And that was because um, in this demonstration, women were having this bags over their bodies which said uh, I'm I'm your aunt or I'm your teacher or something like that to to describe that we are actually everywhere even if you don't see us but uh, yeah and uh, this was also a saying they do not know our strength but in fact I think I think they really do because that's what they are afraid of and that's why it's so difficult or this resistance for women to gather and build shit together is uh, is so strong so yeah that's that's that was that thank you can you hear me joe yes <clears throat> yes i can so uh, we were thinking of getting Christina to come on. Shall, we, shall I get her, uh, see if she'll come on to say a few words? Yeah, you can try. Okay. Because um, here we are, Christina Ellenson. So, Christina, I'm going to get you, so ask you to come on as a panellist. And yeah. if we stop the sharing, we can get... Uh, can I stop the sharing? I think I can do it as well. Yeah. Stop putting this Yeah, and maybe maybe uh, Anne can say a little bit until you see if you can get uh, Ellingson on board. Yeah, and there, Ellen Ellenson <laughs> is on. <laughs> Here we are, Christina. Oh, hello. Thank you, Joe. Um, and um, yeah, I just wrote a question for you. Oh, I forgot it now. <laughs> I can't see it now, but I wanted. I just think this book is so amazing, uh, and I think the the stories uh, around how women um, took collective action and just socialized, you know, like all the effects of just women getting together and doing silly things as well, is just has had had such an uh, um, that it was possible for you to go looking for those things and then find them. Uh, and and just this amazing collection of all those things, like the posters, the pictures, all the um, the the actions, like uh, flyer actions and sticker actions. Like I was wondering, uh, why? What do you think women in the future will find if they want to go looking for like for like the history of like? Or if they go looking like the way you went looking, what kind of culture production do you think uh, women are doing now? Especially in terms of like the women uh, engaged in this um, defense of women's sex-based rights. Are women having a similar kind of culture production now as the one you were able to go looking for and find when you were motivated to 
well, to find these women. Do you, uh, do you get my question? <laughs> I think um, I get your question. Say something and... about that. Yeah, if you are asking, like, uh, for in Norway? Just in, in as an artist, you know, and as a sort of culture, uh, well, expert, like, this is your field. Uh, yeah, in Norway, in the world, I mean, most of the things that we're doing now are dig digital. So it's uh, sometimes, I suppose, difficult uh, for things to last. Like, you have to go looking in very different ways now. As opposed to find, um, but yeah, my question is: in the world, do you see any signs of this kind of culture production that you found when you started looking for your foremothers and then found all these amazing women? Yeah, I think uh, I mean Hungry Hearts, which is like my performance group, have like uh, been making uh, making uh, songs and performances and everything, which is actually about being a woman uh, in a, in a, in in this world. And we also when when I understood uh, this, what this uh, gender identity politics uh, how it harms women we started making songs and actually Anne Marve uh, who is on the line here she's like been writing uh, lyrics to the songs and I think in Norway you will find so little uh, uh, cultural production which like um, uh, talks about uh, how this eff affect lesbians and women but uh, I know that in Turf Island in the UK you have lots of uh, young lesbians who are actually expressing how this uh, gender identity uh, politics affects them, like through rap music, through um, uh, uh, songs, through poetry, through uh, paintings and things. So I think uh, they're real. I think it's important uh, to do to like collect it uh, so we can transfer it and say it was actually a group. Uh, of uh, lesbians and women who did talk about this through art and culture for the future generations but um yeah and do you have anything uh, uh are you working with anything that could uh, that is about that that could yes. be considered kind of like a culture production and in, is there something that women might um, benefit from looking out for yeah, at the moment I'm working with uh, a young lesbian called Raven on a book uh, where we have invited young lesbians to write about uh, how it is to be a young lesbians, lesbian today uh, and then especially because of the gender identity uh, politics. So uh, hopefully this book will be uh, published in, in this year, in 2024. And it's uh, we made like a template, so it's like um, easy for them to to express themselves. So, and I also I'm working on a project where um, like uh, the musicians and the uh, lesbians making poetry uh, to produce it and get it out on Spotify and making videos. So it's like uh, the things are happening. And we, I mean, even though it's really frightening to meet uh, because of the trans activists, especially for young lesbians, uh, it's like we, we always find a way to meet in secret if it has to be that way. And we make, uh, make things and we will get it out there. All right, yeah, I'm going to, right. I'm going to, but in now and say we should we should finish because it's past 11. Okay. Uh, there's one question that you haven't answered that's in the Q&A, Tonya, which is from Gunda. Which year did the Women's Cultural Festival take place? I think the other questions we have answered. The Oslo Women's Cultural Festival. I think Anna should answer that. Uh, was it like in... What, is the, what was the question? Which year did the uh, Cultural Festival in Oslo take place? 1979. 79. Mm, right. Yeah. OK, well, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Tonya. It's lovely to see you, Christina. Brilliant uh, to see Christina. And then the other uh, Anna and uh, participants uh, presenting and hopefully we'll do it again. So really inspirational. So uh, bye, everybody. And see you next week, maybe. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>